have recognized everyone here. We did, I think, worry that what if only engineers show up or what if only the humanities people show up who, who receive the awards? But instead, we had the most diverse representation, I think, in terms of types of research, types of questions, and really um, all demonstrating the huge impact, uh, not just in research, but also in society. Um, the reason partly for why this took 200 years, as Brian noted, is that um, for, for really negative reasons, not just the delay, but also more recently the concern about um, anti-Asian violence and discrimination, uh, which spiked during COVID-19, and also the China Initiative, which was launched by the US government during the last administration. Uh, the first time, I think, in history that the U.S. government launched an initiative that targeted a country and in some ways, I think, also targeted a, an ethnicity. So we're really happy to have this panel. Um, we'll be going from there to uh, the next and final panel advocating for Asian Americans in the United States. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite the um, panelists to come down. Right, I want to get us started. My name is Ann Lin. I'm the Lieberthal Rogo Professor of Chinese Studies um, and Director of the Lieberthal Rogo Center for Chinese Studies and also an Associate Professor in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm incredibly um, honored and delighted to be able to host this panel today and I thank all of you who are here in the audience as well as those of you who are watching live stream. So we conceived this panel to close today's celebration so that we understand that it's not only important to understand where we have come from and where we are, but also to know where we are going. Um, and one of the ways um, in which we um, are able to make to have the space and the freedom to accomplish things at the university and in society is by having the political power um, to make sure that our interests are represented. And so we thought it was really fitting and important to close today with a discussion of advocacy on behalf of Asian Americans. We have an extraordinary panel. Um, and we are especially fortunate um, to be able to have an unannounced guest um, to our panel today, Senator Maisie Hirono. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and I have to say, I am extraordinarily grateful to our football team for bringing her here this weekend. <laughs> Um, Senator Hirono is the first Asian American woman to be elected a U.S. Senator, and she is currently the only immigrant to serve in the U.S. Senate. She came to the United States with her mother at the age of eight from Japan. She has served Hawaii not only as its Senator since 2013, but also in the U.S. House of Representatives as its Lieutenant Governor and as a member of Hawaii's state legislature. Senator Hirono, you are a role model for us um, and for our students, and we thank you for your presence here today. You. It's also a delight for me to be able to showcase trailblazers closer to home. And so I'm delighted to be able to recognize and welcome State Senator Stephanie Chang. State Senator Chang is the daughter of immigrants from Taiwan. She is the first Asian American woman to serve in Michigan's state Senate. State Senator Chang holds a BA, an MSW, and an MPP, thank you, um, from the University of Michigan. As a young activist, she worked on multiple progressive campaigns and co-founded two Michigan nonprofits that work to represent Asian American interests. APIA Vote Michigan, and Rising Voices of Asian American Families. She served two terms in the Michigan House before being elected to the Michigan Senate, and she has been an important part of the Democratic Leadership Caucus in both chambers. We are also delighted to welcome today Lynn Sung, Congresswoman for Councilwoman for Ward 2 on the Ann Arbor City Council. Councilwoman Sung is the daughter of Vietnamese refugees and earned a BA and MSW from the University of Michigan. Prior to serving on city council, she was president of the Ann Arbor Library Board, which is an elected position, as well as the executive director of the Ann Arbor Public Schools Educational Foundation. And Lynn, you may also be the first Asian American on our city council. Oh, I think I'm second. You're second, wonderful. It's okay. like Maybe first woman, I think it's the first woman. <laughs> um, as important as it is to have Asian American political leaders, it's also important to have Asian Americans representing our interests to those elected leaders. And so I'm delighted today to be able to welcome Jung Su An, who is the Interim Executive Director of Rising Voices, a nonprofit that develops the political leadership of Asian American women and Asian American youth. They endorse candidates who stand for progressive values, educate Asian Americans about the political process, and work to surface the needs and help marginalized communities represent themselves. Ms. An is a teacher who has taught herself and has organized teachers to create more just and equitable classrooms most recently as the executive director and chief teaching officer of the Michigan Higher Education Network. And finally today, I'm delighted to welcome Christina Koh, the University of Michigan's executive director of federal relations and its assistant vice president for research, federal relations. Christina leads the office that represents the interests of the University of Michigan in Washington, DC. In recent years, this has included championing, championing, championing our international students when the State Department or the US Congress has tried to limit their numbers, speaking up for Chinese scientists and for international collaboration in the face of bipartisan suspicion of China in Congress, and explaining why university research is so important. For faculty, it's also really important to know that Chris Christina Co helps connect faculty with the right people in DC when our research can influence the public debate. These are five incredible Asian American women who work for our community in a variety of spaces and ways. And so I'd like to start our discussion today by asking each of you to just give us an example of how your work has intersected with Asian American concerns or interests whether that's in specific issue areas or as you advocate for a specific community. And Senator Hirono, maybe we'll ask you to start. Hello, everybody. 
Okay, wake up, everybody. <laughs> well, clearly, uh, I am an advocate, and uh, one place where advocacy is needed, in my view, uh, at every level where decisions are made will, of course, be in the halls of Congress. And so, yes, uh, my awareness of, uh, of the kind of laws that are needed to um, uh, make sure that we have uh, equal opportunity provided in our countries is uh, <laughs> to understand that, that you know, things like the uh, COVID-19 hate crimes bill needed to be enacted. And the fact that I am there and have an awareness and understanding of what happens to minorities, that includes Muslims, that includes women, uh, API community, et cetera, is to bring that understanding to the fore by advocating and through letters and through bills uh, to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that these communities receive uh, the kind of attention and help that they need. And in my view, the, the bill that I think all of you are most familiar with is the um, COVID-19 hate crimes bill, which started off as a purely democratic bill. And it ended up finally one of the first bipartisan bills that was enacted in that session of Congress by, um, uh, in a bipartisan way. <laughs> Not because the Republicans just decided that they should just, you know, at, let it go, but uh, we, we had some battles to get the bill to the floor of the Senate, but every single senator uh, voted for it except for one. Give you one guess. Holly, he of the, yeah. So he was the only senator to vote against that bill, but it was the first time that the members of the Congress uh, had an opportunity to stand with a community that had become targets of hate crimes and hate incidents as a result of COVID. So this is what I do at every turn is so uh, to pay attention to uh, the needs of minority, the minority communities. There are just so many ways that, that um, my being a part of this community intersects with my work as a member of the Senate. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for uh, putting the symposium together, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Also, this is my daughter, Vera. She is unexpectedly my helper today. Uh, wasn't expecting to bring her on the panel, but here she is, and she's doing great. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so when I got into the legislature, that was back in 2015, um, I was the first Asian American woman um, in the Michigan legislature, as was mentioned, um, and uh, we started an Asian American legislative caucus. Um, there were three of us at the time, um, but we started a caucus that included other legislators who represent districts with large Asian American populations. Um, and that caucus still exists today, and I think that actually it was really critical that we had um, you know, this caucus and the, this momentum um, when the COVID pandemic started and when we, uh, I just remember even before the first cases of COVID were identified in Michigan, that uh, myself and Representative Padma Kupa, who is uh, the only Asian American woman in the Michigan House right now, uh, she represents Troy and Clawson, uh, we realized what was coming and, um, you know, the cases that had already been identified in Washington State, and we said, you know, we're, this is inevitable. There's going to be um, a backlash and scapegoating of Asian Americans. And so we need to get out there early. Um, so we started working with our attorney general and with others and uh, actually in hand in hand with specifically actually Chinese and other Asian American community groups to say, let's make sure we get out a press statement. Let's make sure that we um, get out, um, you know, a, uh, I think we did a virtual press conference at the time to really highlight the fact that our attorney general launched a hate crimes unit that she's willing to prosecute and really to make sure that people know who to call and what a hate crime is and what discrimination is. Because I think we all probably know that so many people in our community um, are afraid to ask for help or may not bring issues up uh, if they are feel that they just need to want to just deal with it internally. Um, and so I'm proud that, you know, the work of our caucus and the work of uh, my colleagues and I to make sure that, um, you know, we actually passed a resolution condemning anti-Asian hate two days after the Atlanta spa shooting. We had actually been working on it for about a month beforehand. Uh, and then also we secured 
um, some money in the budget to increase the type of Know Your Rights outreach that our Michigan Department of Civil Rights was doing around hate crimes um, because we knew that, again, we've got to make sure that people understand what their rights are. Um, so those are just a couple of examples, all sort of related to being able to lift up issues affecting the Asian American community and to be able to use the office that we have to uh, try to, um, you know, fi find dollars and also to lift up issues. So, um, you know, it's an honor to serve in the Michigan legislature. There's only a handful of us Asian Americans uh, hoping to increase that number this year. Um, and I think it's really critical that we um, continue to um, elect folks who are going to look out for the interests of Asian Americans. This work. Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jung Soo An, um, and I'm the interim executive director of Rising Voices. Um, Rising Voices' mission is to build power for Asian Americans, specifically women and families. Um, we really work at a grassroots level, which means that all of our people are out in the communities, knocking on doors, having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with everybody in the community, so that every single person in our community can realize their power. And when we're thinking about building power, we're not thinking about like, oh, we want to take over or anything like that. What we're simply talking about is the ability to do. So that means that Asian Americans should be able to see themselves as part of the electoral process. They should be able to engage civically and not have any fear around this. And that's what we're hoping to do at Rising Voices. So some of the issues that we focus on are language access, making sure that any of the processes that uh, we have to participate in to participate in our systems, uh, that they are in language. Uh, we also focus on immigration. Um, we also, right now, especially because this is such a hot topic right now, reproductive justice for all. Um, we added a few people out there uh, to the rally uh, in Lansing just, I think, yes, two days ago. Um, and then one big campaign that Rising Voices will lead in 2023 uh, will be an ethnic studies campaign so that every single child, regardless of who they are or where they are, is recognized um, in the curriculum and in the teaching that happens before them. We know that this is going to be a very long-term campaign, but we believe that we can do it and we're ready to launch it with you all. Uh, but that said, like Rising Voices, it's an organization that is built with Asian Americans for Asian Americans. So everyone in this room too, please like check us out because we have to be like together. Uh, but all that also said is that we don't just see this as an Asian American problem. We also work in multiracial and multi-ethnic coalitions because we know that to build power, we need to do it all together. Uh, so yeah, that's Rising Voices. Hi everyone, I'm Lynn Song, uh, city, council, city Council member here in Ann Arbor. Um, I guess for me, coming to public office early in 2016 for my first role in the library, uh, I think actually I was the first Asian American trustee for that, that one, for, for the library board. Um, I, I was drawn to it because of my own lived experience. I'm first born in this country. My parents are refugees from Vietnam and Laos. Um, my mother graduated college a year before I graduated high school. I grew up studying alongside my parents who worked as janitors, dishwashers. Um, so for me, the way I understand the public system and, and the systems that are supposed to be in service of uh, everyone in this country comes from struggle. And you know, everything from interpreting for my parents to, I don't know, understanding American history, understanding American literature, um, and trying to make room for myself and my family and, and this larger narrative of what it means to be American. Um, so when I, when I first ran for office, I thought that, you know, this, I, I felt like our community could benefit from someone coming from that perspective. Um, traditionally here in our city, the folks who run for local office are older, white, and retired, wealthy. Um, and I felt that uh, this, this is a community that's known for its progressiveness within the state that's, you know, we're surrounded by pretty red communities. Um, and it's honestly a safe haven for a lot of folks who are minorities, LGBTQ folks who are coming from smaller suburban communities. I grew up mostly in Dearborn uh, and then Canton. So for me, when uh, working with Asian American community, Asian American interests comes from my own experiences, my family's experiences. I'm a mother to two children. 
who are Asian American, my partner is Korean American. And I feel like uh, it's an opportunity for me to share these stories and also welcome other voices to the table. Um, during the pandemic, I had constituents who you know, experienced a lot of anguish and, a f and fear. We had mothers who, who called me and said, you know, my kids are being teased on the playground. They're being asked if they eat bat. Uh, I'm wondering if I need to get a gun to protect myself and my family. Um, these are really candid and um, conversations that I'm not quite sure would happen with other representatives. Um, and, you know, that was part of the motivation to organize. Um, I organized, I, I, called, I called it the Asian Aunties Group. So, uh, and I said, so maybe we're the aunties that we've, we've wanted for ourselves. So we would meet every Sunday um, and just comfort each other and try to figure out, you know, how can we get these worries and concerns outside of the small circle? Um, and that became a group that ended up becoming an Asian American uh, parent advisory group for the Ann Arbor Public Schools advocating for a more inclusive curriculum. Um, an artist, a mother who is uh, actually an artist, just debuted um, a piece at the Graduate Hotel last night called Alter Alter, um, documenting the grief and struggles in this community as we try to have these conversations with our own children, with our constituents. Um, and now I'm, as, as the pandemic has progressed, it's been really, uh, really interesting to see how our community, we are the largest ethnic minority group in the city at 18% of the community. Um, it's really interesting to see how we've come together with other community members. I've been working on, um, we had our first black Asian solidarity potluck last year. We're having another one tomorrow. We had 300 people come out for the first one. Um, and actually that was motivated by the anti-Asian hate that we were seeing within our community nationally and also a shooting uh, here in Ypsilanti where a, a Vietnamese man had shot a young black child. So um, it was an opportunity for me to work with black elected leaders and have these conversations about um, racial animosity, misunderstandings, um, and honestly just have our families sit next to each other and eat and commune with each other. Um, we're really excited about it tomorrow. I invite everyone to come out. Um, we'll have soul food, Thai food, Korean food. Um, my son will be playing chess and challenging you all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I guess for me, when we were talking about the Asian American experience, it's deeply personal for me. Um, and I'm hoping that in every opportunity that comes forward when it comes to, you know, we actually did a version of Stephanie's anti-Asian hate um, resolution locally here. Um, and it was passed unanimously, but with a lot of debate where people were really hesitant saying that um, local council members said, I condemn all, all hate. Um, but you know, we had to actually have a really good, it was a good exercise in, in speaking to uh, what, what does white supremacy mean? Um, and we'll, how can we make these distinctions when we say anti, condemning anti-Asian hate isn't, uh, um, isn't, a, isn't a criticism to whiteness, it's, it's, a, it's a criticism to history and power. Um, so anyways, I, I, I love this work. I, um, I'm always looking for candidates to run for local office, so should anyone be moved? by <laughs> the folks here at the table or what you see in community, please come and, and help serve on the library board, school board, city council, county commissions, county health departments. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Professor Lin, for inviting me to join this exceptional group of women today. Um, my role is a little bit different um, than those I'm sitting with on this panel. Um, in my official role as the university's executive director of federal relations, I head the university's um, Washington, D.C. office. It's a small office. Then many people don't realize that universities have Washington, D.C. presence. Um, and it's primarily because the federal government is our largest sponsor, and we partner with them on so many significant initiatives and priorities that align with the nation's priorities. So um, with that said, in my role, official, in, my, in my official role, um, I, in my official role, it's, I go into it without any identity related to politics or ethnicity. I'm in, I have to in the sense that I represent the university's priorities and the university's 
um, interests with our federal policy makers um, and partners. But with that said, I, there are certainly, as Professor Lin mentioned, several vulnerabilities that have arisen in the past few years related to China competitiveness, um, the conflation between competitiveness and espionage, and uh, there has been several pieces of legislation, draft legislation, introduced legislation, um, legislations that have been tacked onto larger bills that have posed um, significant concerns for the university and for leadership at the university. And in that role, then, the interest of our Asian American faculty and our students becomes a primary interest for the university. And in that role, then, I am very focused on the interests in supporting the deans, um, our provost, our vice president for research, and the president. So um, with that said, we also, in, I think in ensuring that we have a dialogue with the Asian American community, we also did several town halls with um, the Asian American Professionals Society, on, or the Asian American faculty groups on campus, um, and also tried to create an open door to ensure that if there were any issues or concerns or vulnerabilities, um, that they were facing or they were hearing and they wanted to reach out and find out what we were doing, they always had the ability to reach out to the Office of Federal Relations and find out what we were doing and we would align ourselves in those ways. So ensuring that we had that constant line of communication was very important to us as we helped inform our policymakers on how these policies would impact the university and our ability to research and educate. Um, with that said, Outside of my official role, there are many ways where I can leverage um, being an Asian American lobbyist if in Washington, D.C. And one of those ways is if I look among my colleagues at other universities, there, we're not a very diverse crowd. Um, I am one of maybe two or three Asian Americans um, in D.C. representing universities. Um, and. I think I'm the only Asian American who actually leads a DC office. And so, but you think about, okay, well, there's a disparity there um, within my community, but then what, what's the feed, the feeder into that community? And those are Hill staff. Um, and I was a Hill staffer many years ago, and I won't tell you how many to date myself, but when I was a Hill staffer, um, this is kind of a funny story. It was 2007, 2008, I was in the DNC in Denver, Colorado, and I was leaving an event, and a friend of mine that I was with kept saying to me, someone's calling your name. And I was like, no one, I don't know anyone here, no one's calling my name. And she's like, no, someone's calling your name. Um, we got out, we left, we called a cab, and this woman comes running out, and she's like, Christina Ko, don't pretend like you don't know who I am, you know who I am. You cannot escape me. You are the only Asian American person on the Hill. Everybody <laughs> knows who you are. And I was like, okay, so they were calling my name. Um, but it was startling to me because I didn't ever think about it in that perspective. And so I think I've made it a personal ambition to mentor students, mentor um, Hill staff to get more Asian American representation on the Hill, but also once they're on the Hill to continue mentoring them um, so that they have, they have resources and they have guidance and someone who can help shape the path of their profession after they leave the Hill as well. And that's the only way we're gonna increase representation in I think DC politics, so. Thank you. So thank you for all of um, thank you for all of your discussions of your work and for the great work that you do. Um, so I'm going to raise something that I think all, many of you have already touched upon. Um, you know, today is billed as a celebration of Asian American accomplishments. Um, and I think for many of us who um, were born in the U.S. or who came here when we were young, um, the, being considered an Asian American comes pretty naturally. Um, my parents are immigrants. They've lived in the U.S. for a very long time. But, you know, and my parents are very well educated, worked in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but 
two years ago, we were watching um, a PBS special on Asian Americans, and you know, it was the episode on the Japanese internment camps. Um, and you have to understand that my parents, like people in their generation, um, were refugees from the Japanese um, in China. Um, and although they have had Japanese colleagues, they you know, did not think of themselves as in any way aligned with Japanese. Uh, but they watched this television special and they said, you know what, oh my god, I, I think for the first time I understand why we have to think about these issues as Asians, you know, and not just as Chinese. Um, and so I guess I, what I'd like to do is sort of to turn that question to you. Um, you know, what are, on the one hand, I, I think we all come from ethnic cultural communities with a great deal of strength, with traditions, with languages, you know, that help us um, and that we want to preserve and, you know, carry forward. You know, and on the other hand, I think, our um, political identity in the U.S. Um, is as Asians, um, and as Asians, you know, obviously with a multitude of different countries and different cultures and different, you know, experiences, etc. And so I'm wondering if you know you can talk a little bit about this. Um, and I know some of you have already started in talking about our connections with other minority communities in the U.S. But how about within the Asian American community itself? Has it as it uh, is the diff are the differences when are the differences a strength and when are they something that we have to work on? I'm a professor, so I tend to ask nasty questions. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I have a question. We have a relatively small group here, so uh, to me, you know, half the battle is showing up. Thank you for showing up. I hope that there, are, there is a larger audience watching this live stream, but um, uh, is this a, a, a process whereby we can, I can listen to what some of them, uh, you may have some questions as opposed to you asking us the questions, not that I have anything against that, but we have a small enough group that I'd like to have more of a dialogue, like why are you guys here? Like, is there something that you're doing that, that is uh, supportive, supportive of, um, of the API community, or, or, or what is it? What is your interest in being here? I am curious to know. Hmm. This is this reminds me so much of law school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. If you don't mind, I really want to hear. Yes. And uh, this uh, promote diversity, but we are not doing it effectively. It's only when we come together, understand I'm Asian American, but underneath that I'm Chinese or Hong Kong American, Taiwanese American, Korean. So if we understand each other better, like these questions, then we know what our agenda is, what we need. Then we really can come uh, together as a united effort and to promote our causes. So that's why I think this kind of dialogue and come out and spit out what you really think, what you feel is very important. I know that within the APIA community, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific Islander uh, American community, we all recognize that we represent some of what, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, APIA cultures, but to the majority, you know, the, the uh, uh, majority community out there, we're, we're all the other. Yeah. <laughs> we are all lumped together. So during the rise in hate crimes against uh, the API community, it didn't matter whether you're a J uh, Japanese, Chinese, or what. We're, we're always uh, the other. And that is why I live in a political environment, and what I see is this fastest growing group of, of people is, is the Asian community, but are we uh, seeing political power that reflects uh, the numbers in our communities? It does not. And so 
we, in my view, uh, if we want to talk about you know influence uh, in our community, it it, it is. Um, one way is through political power, and unless we elect more people, like some of the people here, um, and it's not as though I spend my time just just uh, advocating for the API community, by the way, because there are so many issues. However, uh, uh, that's that kind of organizing and API votes and all that is really important because our our political influence should much more closely reflect the numbers in the community and, and for that to happen, we have to, got to be a heck of a lot more aware and organized and, and vote. And we don't do that enough. I have to say though in Georgia for both John Ossoff and, uh, and for uh, Senator Warnock that the Asian communities vote really made a difference. It, it, what I'm told is that their votes and them coming forward is why the, the, those two senators got elected. So we have the power, we just need to um, know it and to use it and, and use our voices uh, to fight back against the kind of oppression that is going on in our country every moment. So thank you, you are here, but I, I'm just really curious and I don't want to take up everybody's yeah, time, but, I'm pardon? I'm here because you're here. Pardon yes, Jim. Me, but, uh, <laughs> So they're, we call HAPA, and uh, it's interesting because one of them is Asian, and the other one... Uh, oh, can you use that? Okay. Yeah, it'll pick up on the recording. Button. Right, people who are live streaming can't hear you if you one, don't use the microphone. One boy identifies sort of Asian, that's what he thinks of himself. The other one, you know, not at all. Uh, so, and, but in uh, 15 years of being married to this woman, we've traveled all around, and Hawaii's pretty good because it's, there's no majority, so you don't really get much comment or anything. But I, I've never had anything negative happen, you know, and, and being with this Asian family, I've never, never had anything negative happen, but I know it, it does. But uh, when I, I, I had a question I wanted to ask, and that has to do with the litigation that involves Harvard and their admission policies, uh, because you know, one of the arguments is, well, it hurts Asian students. And I just wondered what, if anyone had a comment about that. Um, so I went to uh, speak in, at Harvard with Christine Chen, who uh, is the executive director of API Vote National. Um, she was the, Har I can't remember what it's called. There's a fellowship where, you know, they go to Harvard for, I don't know, like three months or something and bring in guest speakers. So I had the opportunity to go and um, speak with some of the Harvard students. Um, and it was sort of like right in the thick of all of this uh, court case. Um, and the reason why she invited me to come speak to them is because in Michigan, back in 2006, and some of you were probably here at the time, um, you remember that there was an anti-affirmative action ballot initiative here in Michigan. Um, so I worked on the campaign to try to defeat that initiative. Unfortunately, we did not win. Uh, and I think we see the ramifications. We see that in the, um, you know, the effects on our college campuses. Um, but um, one of the things that I think that was really important then and continues to be important now is really to provide information and the truth about uh, the benefits that affirmative action has, uh, that the benefits that affirmative action has provided to Asian Americans as well as other people of color as well as women. Um, and uh, I think that unfortunately Asian Americans have been used as a wedge in this debate um, and really playing upon the model minority myth. Um, and, and honestly, I really feel that the, the being used as a wedge um, is harmful in just so many ways. It's harmful to other communities of color who also benefit from affirmative action, but it's also hugely harmful to um, certain groups within the Asian American community who are far more marginalized and f extremely underrepresented on college campuses. Um, and if we don't have affirmative action and if we can't even go you know, and that means that we can't even go further to make sure that within racial groups that certain ethnic groups are also being prioritized, um, that we're doing everyone a disservice. Uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, diversity makes us stronger and that uh, we learn from one another. Uh, and so obviously I worked on this campaign around affirmative action, so I have strong beliefs about it. Uh, but I, I really, um, I think that 
the way that Asian Americans have been used in this debate has been really, really harmful. Um, and I also think that we have to look within our own community too, because I think that some folks may, ha may have a misconception or may have a belief about this issue um, that isn't necessarily based on real facts. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's like an ongoing conversation. There's so much more that we need to talk about. Um, here in Michigan, I would love to get to the point where we were just not at that point now, but hopefully in the future where we can try to restore um, these policies in our state because I think that uh, I think that we need to. So eager to hear what other people think. And yeah. um, when this was before the Supreme Court, I was here um, for my MSW, um, and I marched in the streets in support of affirmative action. I, I got a call later that night from my parents. They said they saw me on the news. They said, uh, we thought you were in graduate school. Uh, <laughs> aren't you supposed to be in class? I said, oh no, this is class. Uh, this is class in the streets. And I think, they were, I think they were a little bit alarmed, even though I'm clearly, given our origins, we, we come from a political family, right? My, my father was a medevac pilot for the South Vietnamese Air Force. He escaped the day Saigon fell. My mother, uh, was a high school teacher in Laos, and the communists were persecuting anyone who had, you know, any any education. So, um, our beginnings comes from politics, but they were worried about what does it mean to be political in this country, because um, they thought it would put me at risk, my future at risk. Um, but I, it was it was a good conversation to have with my own family, and it's a conversation I have with my children too, in 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 telling them that. Um, it's, it's not an either or situation. Like one, one community, um, like we're not, we're not like fish in a barrel climbing over on top of each other and that we should uplift each other. Um, I'm in strong support of affirmative action. I, I, I'm in surprise, and, and it's reflective here in our community. Um, gosh, even at the public school level, why is our community so segregated? Why do we only have 7% African American population here in Ann Arbor when we had a historically black neighborhood? Um, we have to talk about race, and it doesn't have to be uh, a discussion around why doesn't our community benefit. Um, it should be uh, why aren't we all helping each other? We should be all we all should be at the table. I think that's why that's why we're here. I just like to add that for one thing, the Harvard case is being funded by some very well-off people who contributed a lot of dark money to all kinds of non-progressive causes. So in that instance, the, those students are being used as a sort of like the front people. And it, it really pains me to see a group that has been very marginalized, that would be the API community, being used in this way. Same thing is that that case, I'm very concerned that the, this very far right results oriented Supreme Court is going to determine that racial background cannot be used as a factor for admission. And uh, so even as I'm meeting with all kinds of uh, groups, including the dean of the, the uh, engineering school with 11,000 students, which is awesome because we need a lot more people with STEM backgrounds, but you know, the, the, the the commitment to diversity, which means that you will take into consideration well, racial backgrounds, et cetera. If this Supreme Court says that is forbidden, that is unconstitutional, can you imagine what the result of that would be? I would say that it would not be good. It would be on the order of uh, what the, the chaos that they created with their decision to uh, rescind a row. So, that is the danger that we're not talking about quotas. We already know quotas, racial quotas is unconstitutional. But to consider race as a factor, and if the, this Supreme Court does away with that, that is a, a huge concern. Can you answer a question that you had earlier on how do we talk about um, our identities? Yes. Um, so, uh, I. So I'm, I'm Vietnamese American, I married a Korean American, you know, but I know what it means to be Vietnamese American. So my parents have told our histories and our stories um, and I'm, I've been in community, but I had no sense of what Korean American history was, what the Korean American experience was. And when it, I was here in graduate school, I had just married my husband, but I was still trying to figure this out. And I checked out a book at the graduate library called I Married a Korean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was, 
Uh, it was the story of a, an American woman, a white American woman who had married a Korean missionary in the um, early 1900s and settled there. So uh, clearly not really comparable to my experience here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but you know, I think, I think it takes some work to understand our fellow Asian American community members um, and find opportunities to connect with each other. Here in Ann Arbor, um, my children went to King Elementary, named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Over half of the uh, student population is Asian, Asian American, Asian nationals, and children who are born here. And we've got over 50 languages spoken at this school. Um, it's, a remar it's remarkable, and the children learn from what they bring to lunch at school about each other's um, backgrounds. It's a natural experience. Um, I think as adults, we have to like we have to force ourselves. Honestly, you don't have to go to the graduate library to get a book. Uh, but, um, but you know, in these political spaces where you volunteer, door knock for candidates, and then understand these experiences and open yourselves. I think um, I think we're really fortunate to be in a community where we have multiple opportunities to connect with each other. And it doesn't have to be church. It doesn't have to be political affiliation. Um, it can be happenstance and. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that it can happen through our children. Yeah. Michelle, can you finish this? Yeah. Um, I think just speaking to the point of forming this pan-Asian identity across the state of Michigan specifically, because that's where I work, but it's also, we work with um, like Asian American organizations across the United States too that are working on this same exact problem where we're still at the very, very nascent stages of like, what does that even mean? Like, what does our Asian American political identity actually mean? Um, we know that the origins of this are inspired by black power movement uh, in the 1960s, right? And then uh, it also, we saw like a resurgence of the Asian American identity actually used in the media uh, come after Vincent Chin in 1982. Um, and so therefore there hasn't been like sustained attention to building this identity over time. So if you know we're talking about different ethnicities and whatever and how we need to like all come together, we're still learning how to do this because a lot of us come with old world trauma uh, that doesn't necessarily blend well with other old world trauma, right? So this inter-ethnic organizing is something that we need to actually figure out. It is gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna talk, take a lot of healing. It's gonna take some grit. But if we don't do this, then you know it's gonna be another 40 years like it was since Vincent Chin, when we're gonna see like another spike in anti-Asian hate or whatever that might be, uh, and then we'll be having the same conversation. So it's, you know, it is hard, it's hard. It's, there's no easy way to actually build this like pan-Asian identity easily. Uh, but what it is, is exactly what Lynn was talking about. It's like, let's go out into the communities, do stuff together. Like, you know, know that we are agentic and can actually influence policies. Um, you know, in 2020, uh, 2021, Asian Americans were the margin of victory in many of our elections, right? We know that. And we can build on that and continue to build power from those uh, learnings. Yeah, and I, I need your participation. So on the local level, it's, it's uh, social services, I've passed a resolution on unarmed crisis response, so an alternative to armed police. Um, I, I need Asian American folks to say that we are just as invested in, in making sure that people are taken care of in this, in this community. Um, otherwise, the conversations are, you know, potholes in the roads, the deer are eating my hostas. Uh, and <laughs> they're, they're just trash. more, right, and I need my trash to be picked up regularly. <laughs> I, I, but, you know, we also, so at the city level, we manage a police budget. That's a third of our overall police, uh, of our overall city budget, right? Um, we manage water, so, you know, when there was, uh, our water source was polluted a couple weeks ago. That's a serious concern that we should all share. Um, we manage pedestrian safety when students are, are hit you know, by commuters, when we have 80,000 commuters a day coming in and out of Ann Arbor. That's an issue that concerns everyone here. When we lack affordable housing, um, this is, we have to talk about zoning and why people can't afford to live where they work or go to school. So you know, most of the people who submit comments and come to our meetings are older, white, and retired. Um, I need folks who are here in this audience to call, come in, and, and advocate for your families and for your neighbors uh, and your colleagues. There were other, yep, there were other hands I know in the audience. Hi, oh, sorry, wow. Uh, my name is El Tantai, uh, pronouns are they, them, theirs. 
I'm a first year social work student, so I'm really glad to see so many social workers in politics. That's cool, because I wanted to do interpersonal and policy, so that's great. Um, and why I'm here, I'm a Philippine ex-American uh, from New York City and did a lot of organizing there. Uh, I worked for Apache Community Health Center, which is one of the oldest like um, HIV AIDS organizations in the country that served Asian Pacific Islanders before they um, even recognized that uh, people living with HIV AIDS could be of Asian Pacific Islander descent. It all, uh, also makes me think of what you were just talking about, Jung Su, about um, this, this kind of move to try to build like a pan-Asian um, identity and also the challenge of recognizing how much we've um, been placed into this monolithic identity of um, Asianhood and like how do we how do we build political power together while also trying to rec recognize that we have such different experiences across the the different regions of Asia. Um, so that's just something that came up when you're when you were speaking. So thank you for that. Uh, my question um, is really around uh, critical race theory because I do a lot of um, education and con consultation around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And uh, the legislation that we see around critical race theory and even like you know not being able to speak about gender and sexuality, are, I think, are big threats in our educational system, but even in government and in um, our business sectors. Uh, so, uh, is there any policy that we can get around now, uh, and we can try and make sure that we're trying to move on the ground? Or what are you? What do you think um, is the best way for folks uh, who aren't currently involved in, um, like, actively in politics, to be able to push against uh, these, you know, anti-critical race theory, anti-LGBTQ uh, speech kind of um, policies? So we have in the Michigan legislature, which um, is you know re Republican uh, majorities in both chambers, um, we had there's legislation pending in both chambers that is exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know, there's a version around specifically banning critical race theory. There's another version that's very weirdly worded around like like the idea of teaching things around race, basically anything that might make a, a person who's white uncomfortable is really like my takeaway. Uh, of what the bill is about. Um, and then we've got bills that are specifically targeting LGBTQ youth around, um, you know, no, no trans kids in sports. Um, and, and we sort of have been holding our breath and sort of anticipating if there might be a, a don't say gay type of legislation. There hasn't been so far in Michigan. But um, anyway, so with all of that said, um, that is sort of the backdrop. Um, and one of the things that, so my, co my Democratic colleagues and I have talked a lot about these bills and talked about the fact that there, there are folks who are really trying to prey upon like parents who are just like angry. They're just angry and afraid of, you know, for whatever reason, um, and that we've got to really channel like, there's so much parent anger around other real life issues. These are not issues. Like these are, there's no, the, the, the things that, that, that these bills are trying to attack are like not even problems, um, but there are real problems that parents are facing, and so like let's talk about those. But in the meantime, uh, we also have in the Michigan legislature um, introduced legislation um, in the wake of all of this anti-Asian hate uh, legislation, not only to include Asian American history in our curriculum, but also black history, Latinx history, indigenous and Arab and Chaldean history. And it's very intentional um, because we, you know, we know there's been this national movement and congratulations to Rhode Island for just recently <laughs> passing their version of this bill of ensuring Asian American history is taught in schools. Um, but we also know that Michigan's a diverse state. We've got to make sure that every, every ethnic group and every racial group is recognized in our curriculum, not just for the sake of like my kids and like your kids, um, but also um, for kids of other racial backgrounds so that they are learning uh, about one another's histories. Um, and sometimes I think about the fact that what if 40 years ago, everyone was learning about each other's histories? Maybe, you know, Vincent Chin wouldn't have been murdered with a baseball bat. Maybe we wouldn't have the type of hate that we continue to see, um, you know, in our communities today. Um, I think it could be really, really powerful. So 
I'm sure Jungsoon wants to jump in, but just it's something that I think we really absolutely need to focus on. Um, and it's also something that I think people understand um, and that we've got to fight back against sort of the hateful legislation um, and not be afraid to talk about it because um, because th that those bills are coming from a place of fear and anger, um, whereas the bills that we're talking about inclusion and diversity and making sure that we're actually learning the hard stuff about what's been happening in our country um, is really, really critical and come from a place of um, you know, really wanting to um, create a better sense of belonging and inclusion and, and more love. So, um, so thanks for your question. Um, so Stephanie provided like the backdrop um, to just everything that she's introduced um, in the Senate right now. But uh, Rising Voices is also launching a campaign to work on this. Uh, so we need to mobilize our communities, but the first thing that we need to do with our communities is actually provide a political and public education to ourselves about like what is the Asian American identity exactly? What does that have to do with critical race theory? What does that have to do with what's going on in schools right now? What does that do have to do with like how our children will grow up in the society that they will be able to build or not, right? So uh, first step is that, uh, that we're hoping to do. We need to mobilize our parents, but we also need to mobilize our teachers within the infrastructure because they're gonna be the ones who are implementing this curriculum. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what our campaign will be about, but we can't do it alone. And really what is like Rising Voices needs right now, what Lynn needs, what like everybody on this panel right, needs is a base. Uh, so that means that like we have a base that's ready to rally with us when the time comes to be, right? When we need them. Um, and so that means that we need to be organized. We need to be somewhat aligned. We don't need to all agree on exactly the same things or think exactly the same things. Uh, but we need to know that like we're here for each other. We're a community uh, so that we can actually push back on things like, you know, anti-CRT bills or advocate for the AAPI history bills. We also need to find partners in industry too. Like these, these, these noise legislative efforts are, are distractions and they hurt our state's reputation, right? So for the engineers and geeks in the, in, the, in the audience, if you're wondering what is happening, what is this conversation around, it hurts our state's ability to be competitive, to keep young people here, to attract talent here. Um, if, why should graduates stay in a state like Michigan when you know, reproductive rights are, are, are being challenged, when minority communities are being threatened. Um, we have to fight for this so that, you know, our, I would like my own children to choose Michigan to be a place where they can stay. Um, and I'd like, you know, my, my husband who is on, um, he started a company called Duo Security here um, and was able to grow from three people in a corner office to a pretty large company. So if everyone logged in for Duo on your phones, I'm sorry, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my husband. but. Part of the reason why our family stayed in the state of in Michigan, he's actually from Maryland, is because there's potential here. There's potential to have these conversations and to fight for that potential here. Um, and there's potential for progressiveness. So there's room for us to build to this idea that we can be better than um, who we are right now. So uh, I hope that these efforts aren't a distraction. CRT is not an issue at our elementary level. Funding school lunches is an issue at our school level right now. Uh, Mitch McConnell is an issue uh, for not funding school lunches. So, I mean, we have to really focus on what is really happening, who is responsible for this, and also think about how we partner with not only other social workers and politicians, but honestly, private industry and geeks who are having a difficult time, you know, attracting funding, attracting talent here because, I mean, you, you have a choice of all the states and, um, when I think we're like 40th in, in funding higher ed. Um, let's make it more attractive by being um, more equitable. It's, it's, it's a good step. So uh, please, Geeks, you, you are part of this conversation too. <laughs> um, Christina, actually, I was going to ask you, do you get pushback? Um, the University of Michigan has, is very proud of its DEI effort and is very upfront about it. And I'm wondering if you get pushback from people in Congress about that and what you say? Um, 
the University of Michigan has been very outspoken, especially on issues related to science and security and issues related to China in particular. Um, I wouldn't say that I've gotten any outright pushback um, from congressional offices or staff. I will say that I worked very closely in trying to amend language to a bill that would have been potentially very harmful um, to Chinese nationals trying to get visas to come to the country to do research. Um, and I think that in negotiating some of those interests, I think that there was often kind of a, um, an underlying suspicion that perhaps I was only advocating for this because I was self-interested. Mm -hmm. um, and so having our president come out at that time and say, no, this is a <laughs> bill that we cannot stand behind, really took that pressure off and really was like, no, this is a University of Michigan stance. I think having leadership behind that um, was very, criti was very critical. Um, but to that point, I mean, I think certainly there is a growing hesitation in working with, I think, Asian American um, lobbyists, perhaps in s and especially related to universities. I will say um, in the last administration, I had a meeting on an issue related to research that would impact our national security. Um, and it just so happened that this was an issue area that China has invested quite a bit of money in. And will, if they have not outcompeted us in this area, they have, they will. Um, and when they turned the conversation to our researcher who was in the meeting with me, um, they said, well, tell us, you know, what is China doing? What are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? And then I was like taking notes because I was trying to like record what the questions were and so I can remember what we needed to follow up. And I looked up and everybody was looking at me and it was uncomfortable initially and then um, our researcher just kind of filled in the space and just started talking and informing it. But it, you know, it was one of those moments later where I kind of wish I was just like, so I'm an American <laughs> um, and so I think that we do face those things, but I, I would say that they tend not to be so brazen, typically. Well, so there is a very strong anti-China uh, perspective in both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. I did work on the CHIPS bill that had language that would have created an environment where there probably would have been attacks against Asians because who knows Chinese from Japanese from Koreans? So the, the, the kind of language that we put into our bills that create this kind of environment, we have to be very careful. There is a very strong anti-China uh, fervor, I would say, um, that uh, comes across in committees such as the, the Armed Services Committee or the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, all of that. So the, the, the racism in our country is never far below the surface, in my view, and eternal vigilance is required. The really important thing that I want to leave with all of you is how critical it is that we elect people at the local level, because a lot of these battles, who's going to protect uh, against the elimination of teaching of uh, Asian history, the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act, the internment of Japanese Americans, except people at the state legislative level. It's turning, it's becoming that, that a lot of the battles, a lot of the protections voting protections and uh, all of those protections will be fought at the state level, especially as we, we now have a very right-wing majority Supreme Court that are devolving all of these things to the states and to the local governments. So who we elect here uh, is going to really impact our lives in ways that the uh, members of Congress are not able to do unless we get rid of a filibuster, which is a, yet a whole another <laughs> battle that I would like to have a chance to fight. But to do that, we need a couple of more Democratic senators. That's a whole another thing to discuss, but okay. So you guys are really important. Thank you for fighting the battle. <laughs>
want to say in conclusion again today, um, thank you very much to the other symposium organizers who put in a ton of work at a very busy time in the year to put this together. And also my thanks to the provost's office who really um, funded today's celebration and strongly supported it. And we are really happy to see that the university um, has these issues on its agenda and hope with your help to keep these issues on the university's agenda. Thank you. We got Ketanji Jackson would never have happened, of course, were it not for President Biden. In fact, one of the things that we really have to focus on, on is making sure that we fill every single judicial position we can. And when uh, Trump filled over something like 200 judicial positions, lifetime appointments, four on the Supreme Court, and so uh, some 75% of uh, President Biden's Judicial nominees have been minorities. A big per number of those have been women. Uh, just two days ago, we had two Third Circuit Court nominees, one who was an Asian person. So, you know, you got to get, get the, you have to fill the par pipeline, really. <laughs> it's not like we're going to sit here and demand that we have a, a justice of a certain race, you know. I think we need to just uh, be very aggressive in electing people who have uh, uh, the, the kind of advocacy views that we want um, to be making these decisions at the state level because a lot of the barriers that are being erected are by all these Republican-controlled legislatures of which we have, what, the majority of our state legislatures controlled by election, uh, by Republicans. And who voted them in? It's us. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and it is us. So people who can fix that. Anyway, hold that thought, okay? <laughs> Ketanji Jackson is gonna to have to write a lot of really strong dissents.